There is no beating around the bush on this one. I hate the fact that it's taken me almost four years to finally play Hellblade Senua's Sacrifice. I'll be straight up with you from the beginning. This is one of my favourite gaming experiences, I think, ever. I honestly don't know what took me so long. I've enjoyed Ninja Theory's previous works with Enslaved, Odyssey to the West, and yes, the DMC reboot. From the outside, it looked like a hack and slash set inside Norse mythology, which are both a genre and setting I love. It was highly praised at release, and most importantly, it looked like an experiment with the format that is gaming, which I'm always game to try. Not only did all these elements lead me to believe that, yeah, Hellblade sounds like it's right up my alley, which is shameful enough that it took me so long on its own, but I also picked the game up within a month of its release. I know, my backlog of games is an absolute mess from years of buying every game at release and then not playing them. A habit I've thankfully stomped out since making this series. But enough dilly-dallying. You already know my brief thoughts on Hellblade Senua's Sacrifice after I finally played it. I think it's incredible. So incredible that I'm double spoiler warning this video. If you have not played Hellblade for yourself, I strongly recommend and urge you to do so before watching this video. It's a special game for so many reasons that I'll be diving into in today's video, and I don't want to see you commenting by the end of the video, damn, I wish I played this before watching, because I warned you. With the formalities out of the way though, sit back, relax, and welcome to, so I finally played, Hellblade Senua's Sacrifice. Hellblade's story is a complicated one to synopsize, to say the least. I mean, when the story was all said and done, I was mixed between being utterly in awe at what I just experienced, and also simultaneously a bit confused. The story is one that sticks with you once it's concluded, because it leaves you second guessing what happened, what was real, what wasn't which potentially leads to, what does this mean? If it wasn't real, what was the symbolism or significance? A lot of details can be interpreted different ways by the end. So for the sake of my sanity, I've decided to break down Hellblade's story in chronological order, rather than how we actually experience the story in game. There is just a lot of flashback storytelling here, and I think it'd be easier to look at this as a story explained rather than a story commentary. There is some historical talk as well during the story and just know I'll go over the historical inspiration in its own segment. First, the basics though. Hellblade is set during the late 8th to early 9th century and we follow the journey of redemption for our protagonist, Senua. Senua is on a quest to save the soul of her dead lover, Dillian, by venturing into Helheim, or Hell, to confront the goddess within, named Hela. What is strange about Senua venturing into Helheim, however, is she isn't a Viking or Northman, as they are called in game. She's a picked warrior from Orkney, a group of islands in Scotland, and to understand why she is venturing so far from home, now we have to dive deeper into the rest of the story, most importantly, Senua's backstory. Senua has suffered with what we would call psychosis, but what the game classifies as a curse, due to the time period Hellblade is set in, from a young age. This curse sees Senua suffering from voices in her head called Furies and hallucinations. Senua's mother Galena also had the curse, but she assured Senua that it was no curse and instead a gift from the gods. 
Sanua's father, the devoutly religious Zinbel, disagreed. Zinbel assaulted and abused both his wife and daughter, believing this curse, well, to be a curse, that would consume them both in darkness, which would lead to the town's demise. This way of thinking would lead Zinbel convincing the town that Galena was a witch, while Senua was a young girl, and her mother was burned alive in front of her. A memory she would suppress and believe her mother killed herself to escape the curse. Without the support of her mother, her father went on to abuse and assault Senua further, locking her up more often than not and poisoning her mind. Very rarely, Senua was allowed to leave the house, but this is how she would spot Dillian, a boy from town she would spot in the woods training his sword skills. Senua would go back as often as possible to try and learn these skills from afar and practice in her own time. At some point though, Dillian spotted Senua watching and introduced himself, impressed by what Senua had managed to learn just from watching. Dillian offered to teach her and through practicing together is how they fell in love. Around this time, a plague would hit the town, killing many townspeople. One of these victims was Dillian's father. Senua's father blamed her for this plague as he said it was evidence of her curse and Senua started to believe her father was right and thought Dillian hated her. This wasn't the case, and Dillian was very supportive of Senua, but she felt the need to flee the town and hopefully be rid of this curse. While exiled, Senua met a man named Druth, a former slave of the Northmen who escaped captivity, but not without serious injuries. Druth would tell Senua of the Northmen's religious beliefs and rituals before he met his death due to injuries. With Druth dead and a year of exile, Senua finally returned home. But what she found at home was not what she'd left. The town is destroyed, the villagers and townspeople dead, and her lover strung up a victim of the gruesome blood eagle ritual. Senua is distraught, believing all of this to be her doing but remembers Druth's stories of the Northmen and their rituals. The Blood Eagle, meaning Dillian's soul, cannot find rest, and this is why she must go to Helheim to bargain with Hela for Dillian's soul. This all leads us back to the beginning of the game and arriving at Helheim, which is where your own interpretation may differ because Senua suffers from both subtle and vivid hallucinations. So, whether Senua in fact went to the gateway to the Norse underworld, or found an island and her mind did the rest, these sorts of details are how you perceive them to be. But let's just talk about Senua's journey to and through Helheim and go over the symbolism and what ifs soon. Before Senua can enter Helheim, she must defeat the fire giant Surt and the spirit of illusions Valraven. Once defeated, Senua makes it to the gates of Helheim only to be swiftly thrown from the bridge by Hela, which in the process destroys her sword. Barely alive, Senua regains consciousness and follows visions of Druth and a bright light figure she believes to be Dillian. These visions lead her to a sword stuck in a tree. This is the legendary sword called Gram. The sword is shattered into pieces from the previous owner Sigurd after he faced Odin and Senua must complete four trials in order to repair and free the sword if she is to have any hope of defeating Hela. Once Senua has completed the four trials, she releases Gram from the tree and is now ready to enter Helheim. Helheim is where Senua fights against the darkness's influence what she once believed to be part of her illness, but realizes this entity is a representation of her father's abuse and beliefs. Senua defeats Garm, essentially the Cerberus of Norse mythology, and finally, Senua confronts Hela. Kind of. Senua faces waves and waves of Northmen, 
but eventually is overwhelmed and falls in battle. Senua begs Hela to save Dillian's soul, but she refuses. In her final moments, Senua recalls a conversation she had with Dillian about the importance of accepting loss, and as Hela throws Dillian's head into the abyss, it circles back to Senua being in Hela's place, and Hela dead beside her. Senua finally accepting that it just isn't possible to bring back Dillian. He's dead, but she is not to blame for his death. Senua frees herself of the darkness's influence and finally accepts the Furies as a part of who she is. And that is the story for Hellblade. Unless you found all the lore stones like myself. The lore stones themselves elaborate on events per chapter, but if you manage to find them all, you get one extra bit of information that in my opinion allows Senua to move the blame off herself. Before you face Hela, you learn that Druth, or rather Finden, was captured by the Northmen and kept alive because he spoke multiple languages. Finden originally hoped to be able to garner peace between the Picts and the Northmen, but under torture folded and gave them locations they could go to for more slaves and treasures. It was with his time with the Northmen though, where a cloaked figure, presumably Senua's father, made a bargain for free passage through their lands. Once again, presumably Zin Bell told the Northmen about his village, and this led to the destruction and Dillian's death. A short scene, but an incredibly satisfying detail to learn. Not vital to understanding the story, but it just fleshes out the backstory just that tad more. But that's it. That's the story for Hellblade. It feels like it's been a while since I've done a big ol' story segment in my videos, but for me, there was no way around it for Hellblade. Before I dive into the what ifs or symbolism of certain characters, sceneries or whatever for the story though, I've got to talk about Senua as a character. This story doesn't work the way that it does without having an incredible character like Senua. Melina Jurgens, I definitely didn't say that right. Senua's actress did a phenomenal job as she portrays, it feels like, every possible emotion to a gripping level. This feat even more impressive when I learned that this was her first crack at acting, and her job originally was to edit behind the scenes videos at Ninja Theory. As soon as you begin the game, Senua intrigues you, and it doesn't take long, at least it didn't take me long at all, to become both invested in her character, but both empathize and sympathize with her quest. Now, thankfully, I personally am yet to experience problems with my mental health, and by no means do I know essentially anything about a lot of mental issues such as psychosis. But that doesn't mean I can't empathize with this immense struggle that people deal with in regards to mental health and connect with Senua as a character. But while psychosis is at the forefront of many elements in game, what really connected me to Senua as a character was something I think most of us can relate to. Dealing with loss. Losing a loved one is hard, the grief is immeasurable, and whilst the quest to find her lover's soul may seem simplistic in comparison to the rest of the story elements, it's because of this element of grief and just willing to try anything to see your loved one again that I think connected me to Senua the most. Moments like when Senua loses Dillian's head and the distress she emotes only to find it shortly after, and being so willing to complete this quest that she doesn't care she has to face this demonic boar dog just to keep that sliver of hope alive. Sure, the ending is a little predictable in terms of, well, due to the dark nature of the game, it was hard to see Dillian coming back, but I was so invested in Senua's story and journey through grief 
and battling herself and her psychosis that I felt like I accepted his death along with her. I cannot speak highly enough of Senua and her story. There is honestly nothing like it. Now, with Senua's psychosis comes the room for interpretation. As I've stated, did she reach Helheim or not is up to you, along with many other examples. So, here are some of my theories or opinions on what exactly went down in Hellblade. No, I don't think Senua ever went to Helheim. I believe Senua sailed off from Orkney, but found a nearby island, and her mind led her through this path of acceptance. There are a lot of reasons why I'd say this is the case, but all my theories stem from Senua's relationship with Druth. Senua only knew about the Blood Eagle, the Northmen, and their gods because of Druth. And you can see this most prominently in her visualization of Hela. Half of Hela is charred to a crisp, and the other half is a pale, rune covered side, reminding me of Senua's self image as the darkness her father labeled her as. Hela to me represents Senua's main traumatic sources, witnessing her mother's death and her father's abuse and critique of herself. This was something that only really became apparent after I'd finished with Hellblade. After Senua accepts the Furies, accepts Dillian's loss, that's when Hela appears dead next to her. A symbol of moving on, or at least, again, accepting her trauma, not allowing it to cause her damage any longer. This can obviously be further expanded to the Northmen and the fear of the stories Senua's been told, but never actually seeing them for herself, amplifying their terror in her mind, or bosses like Surt representing potentially the town and her big bad father burning her mother alive. Theories can run wild and vary depending on who you ask. I've heard other whole game theories that I found intriguing and obviously possible, as I said, it's about your own perception, of things like, again, she didn't reach Helheim, but Senua is actually making her way through Viking lands and actually seeing dead bodies and killing the Northmen just through the hallucinations amplified the reality. This one gives me more of a psychotic break vibe though, which personally, whilst I can see, I don't think that's the message about psychosis Ninja Theory was aiming for. But as I said, there isn't a wrong answer. Again, interpretation is the name of Hellblade's story. What I see and think, you may see and think otherwise. But what I know is a fact is how much I loved my time experiencing this story. There are elements of the story and Senua's character I haven't even gone over yet and that's because I want to talk about these highlights, but they are more prominent in other aspects of the game. I loved experiencing Senua's story. When she was scared or motivated, beaten down or enraged, defeated or accepting, Whatever she was feeling and experiencing, I felt connected to her and more than anything, I wanted to do the best I possibly could to make sure we got where we needed to be and see what awaited us at the other side. And I think that level of immersion really says something to the quality of the storytelling here in Hellblade. The real history surrounding Hellblade is one I find really fascinating for one central reason. The Picts. The Picts were a group of tribes inhabiting Scotland, but there isn't a whole lot of information about them. Lost to history type. But I was determined. There had to be something. Someone must have looked into these groups of tribes. And I was right. I found a course through Audible, maybe if I bring them up enough they'll eventually sponsor the channel, called The Celtic World as a part of their series called The Great Courses, and it had a lecture on the Celts and Picts in Scotland. 
This lecture was a big help because it helped me visualise the type of people that inspired Hellblade. So the term Pict or Picti was invented by the Romans to describe the group of tribes north of Hadrian's Wall, untainted by Roman control and deemed as savage barbarians. The term Picti is Latin for the painted ones, although it is debated whether the Picts did in fact paint themselves, it wouldn't have been as severe as something like in Braveheart at least. Now, the Romans demeaned the Picts constantly, but that really is due to the fact that they were a problem for their occupation in Britain. Hadrian's Wall is in essence Rome's admittance that the Picts, I should mention that the Picts is the Roman name, it is believed that they didn't refer to themselves as this and probably as Celts, weren't to be messed with. They were fierce warriors. Alas, however, much like many historical periods, there is further debate around many surrounding aspects of the Picts, such as if they eventually made their way over to Ireland, what language they spoke, even what religion they would believe in. But the most interesting bit of information as to why Ninja Theory decided to set the game around a Pictish warrior relates back to the story about mental health. The Picts are believed to have been a culture that, due to the Viking raids and invasions, were replaced. Vikings took over the majority of the population of the land, more specifically the islands of Orkney from the Picts. Now, whether they were somewhat peacefully integrated, enslaved, killed or sacrificed, no one seems to be able to verify one way or another, and this pertains to the validity of the Blood Eagle sacrifice as well, as that is debated whether it was ever implemented. What makes all of this so interesting though is the Celts' views on mental disorders though. The Celts referred to those driven mad by a curse, grief or trauma as a Gelt. The Gelt would be exiled or take to a life in the woods to search for penance and punishment. So, you pair the history of the Picts and the Viking invasions of Orkney with the history of mental disorders and beliefs of the early Celts, it makes for a surprisingly impressive way to immerse yourself with true history and tell a story today about mental health. Ninja Theory really did their research well on this one, and not just in regards to psychosis. But even with little things like Druth or Findon, who is based on a real Irish Celt who was enslaved by Norsemen in the 8th century, escaped and went on to become a monk. And the name Druth was another word used by the Celts to describe mental disorders as it means fool or one who utters the words of God. Then you base Senua's character on the story of Boudicca, Senua's name coming from the Celtic goddess Senuna, which was lost to history and rediscovered and mispronounced Senua. There is a lot of good solid history backing Hellblade, which I absolutely love as you should already know. It's impressive for a studio to do so much research for a game on such in-depth topics, and I think they nailed it here. I know, still haven't talked about the gameplay yet, but bear with me, we'll get there. First of all, on a base level, I was in love with the visuals and sound for Hellblade. I thought the visuals did an incredible job at evoking the right emotions, such as panic, fear, hopelessness, happiness, triumph, whatever the game wants you to feel, the visuals help you get there instantly. And same goes for the soundtrack. When Senua's in a panic, the soundtrack increases that feeling. When she is losing a battle, the soundtrack amplifies. When you feel certain ways in game, the soundtrack just elevates that emotion to the next level. And
both elements pair together and go off one another to make for the perfect eye and ear candy depending on the given situation. But it's that base to Hellblade, the psychosis, where the visuals and sound take to a whole new level. Again, not an expert on the subject, but from what I've gathered, psychosis can take various forms, both mild and severe. The hallucinations can be subtle, from brighter lights to something being there one minute and not there another, to the stuff of nightmares. Same goes for voice hearing, with cases of more passive to the aggressive and intimidating kind. When you learn about the different experiences of those with psychosis, the decisions in-game make a lot of sense, and Ninja Theory completely succeeded in making the player feel a part of Senua and her mind. The voices are what you'll notice right from the jump, as the technology they used make voices feel distant, some right in your ear, and different voices talking and conflicting over one another. The Furies fuel that self-doubt, they are very rarely helpful, and it's when the Furies become the loudest or the darkness chimes in, when through the visuals you can see Senua's mind descending further into nightmares. It's coming. That song again. Is it? Is it? Is it? It's Hella. Yes, the source of the darkness. It's coming. This is your moment. I honestly cannot talk highly enough about both the visuals and sound because without these elements being as strong as they are, that incredible level of immersion doesn't work. From the introduction, you almost instantly sink into being Sanoa. The emotions she feels, the things she is witnessing, these have that impact and stick with you even when you've stopped playing because Ninja Theory did their research and allowed people to experience a deep dive into this illness through many aspects in game. But the moments that will stick with me the longest is that visual direction and the sound design. Well, took us a fair whack into this video, but we're finally talking about the game aspect to Hellblade, which is probably the simplest aspect to discuss. Hellblade is a third person hack and slasher mixed in with a good heap of puzzles. In combat you have a light and heavy attack, block or parry and a dodge as well as a focus ability which slows down time or breaks enemies out of the imaginary I guess is the best term. The puzzles rarely vary from finding runes in the environment and unlock doors to progress, but occasionally there will be an extra element thrown in for good measure too. That's it in terms of basics and I think that's why whenever I see others review Hellblade the gameplay is a bit of a letdown for some because it doesn't have the same elements as the other aspects of the game. Now, do I think the gameplay is as impressive as the rest of the game? No, and I can understand why it can be a disappointing element of Hellblade for some, but that doesn't mean I didn't love playing this game. The combat is simple, but I had a good time with it and it's no punk in terms of challenge, with some arenas like the Sea of Corpses being downright brutal and intense segments to get through. Some bosses as well really kicked my ass, like Valraven for some reason, and the Hella fight with the numerous bosses at once. The puzzles do follow a pretty straight and narrow formula, but they mix it up enough to feel different from puzzle to puzzle. Some runes being obvious, some obscure, and really looking carefully at your environment. I know this is going to piss some people off as well, but I loved walking in this game. 
It's the downtime in between the fights or the puzzles that really let me absorb everything. Look for the lore stones, get more story, hear more lines of dialogue from the Furies, take in the environments, and just try and piece together this world. It's actually why I enjoyed the trial so much. You don't have your sword anymore, so there is no combat. It's a lot of walking, doing some puzzles, and absorbing information, which amongst the chaos of other moments is really refreshing. For some, there may be a little too much downtime or walking around. I've heard some say the trials were a bit of a drag, but I was absolutely enthralled. There is so much going on in regards to Hellblade's story, visuals, and sound that I personally didn't need anything too flashy in regards to the gameplay. Could some areas be improved? Of course. The combat could have been fleshed out somewhat with some more combos, some bosses are a little too easy with the focus ability, changing up the puzzles would be appreciated, but there are still some great highlights to be experienced as is. I love the trial of the blind and being immersed in darkness, following small, subtle glimpses of light only to find creatures unknown to us lurking around as well. The labyrinth that is easy to get lost in, repeating the same areas over and over again if you didn't pay attention to the subtle map on the ground in the beginning. Surt Realm and escaping mass fires, Val Raven's illusions, the sea of corpses, Helheim and trying to escape the darkness, that feeling of safety quickly washing away from Northman ambushes, even just walking along a beach and taking in what's going on. I think there is a lot to like here in Hellblade's gameplay, even though it isn't as flashy as some other aspects we experience in-game. I could see it turning some people off, and when compared to other things Hellblade does, it is easy to point out the gameplay's flaws. But I seriously loved it. As I stated at the beginning of this video, I hate that it took me so long to finally play Hellblade. I love this experience so much, I really do have trouble faulting it. The visuals are beautifully dark and somber. The soundtrack and sound design is impeccable. The story is captivating. Senua as a character is so easy to empathize with and relate to her story, even if it's just in certain aspects. And the game brings an important awareness to mental disorders that, if you're like myself, you may have been ignorant to beforehand. The gameplay is the big iffy part for many, but I still loved playing this game. I wholeheartedly believe Hellblade is a must experience game. Obviously, if you are dealing with your own mental struggles and don't want to experience that in your gaming, I 100% understand that. But for everyone else, give the game a go if you watch this video without playing the game yourself. The game's always on sale, it's on Game Pass, give it a crack. Hellblade is a different and unique gaming experience and it'll stick with me for a long time to come. I'd throw it up there as an all time favorite of mine now and I cannot wait to see what's in store for us with Hellblade 2. I just hope I can get a PC upgrade or a new console before then because I do not want to miss out again. For now though, this has been So I Finally Played Hellblade Senua's Sacrifice.